first of all, we started on time. I went, wow, <laughs> that was happening. Prayers are being answered, <laughs> right? You guys are singing. It was to the top of your lungs. It's just, it's great. I'm just sitting there listening in. I'm like, man, everyone is just immersed in this intimacy of worship. And I love how Holy Spirit, he, he just takes us from every walks of life, and doesn't matter what kind of week we had, he just brings us in, and it's just, and he uses us, right? And I know Yuri, you know, he's a business owner, and he's been really, really busy. And when he says, like, it's been a tough week, please believe him. <laughs> it's, it's been a really tough week. And at the same time, I'm, like, trying to, because uh, we we're, we're working together, obviously, and I'm, like, trying to contact him. I'm, like, Yuri, Yuri, you know, and he's not answering. I'm, like, oh, God, <laughs> you know. And at the same time, working with Yuri for such a long time, no one is just, like, he knows. He knows what to do. And the beautiful leading of Holy Spirit, when he just takes us and he leads us, and everything just falls in its place. And it's beauty. And so uh, just seeing all of that, it's just it's amazing. Seeing the women out here uh, and, and uh, women, uh, hearing about women's ministry makes me want to say, man, come out. Uh, yeah, they're not going to come out. <laughs> Right? And we want to talk about our ministries. Yeah, we, uh, we do breakfast once in a while, right? Uh, uh, we, we have a men's retreat once a year, you know, like we do stuff, right? But it makes me want to do that. But our church is growing, and we're going through things. We're going through growth. As a matter of fact, Holy Spirit has been very active in here, and I've been seeing a lot of, a lot of personal growth, growth within you guys, and he's been adding to the church. And I usually don't do this, but Brent, I'm going to put you on the spot. Brent, raise your hand. <laughs> this is Brent, and he just became a believer. <laughs> Welcoming him into our family, you know, just uh, honestly, just come up, say your name. But God's doing things. God's doing things. You know, Holy Spirit is do, is moving in this church, and, you know, maybe you're like, oh, man, this is just such a, not a well-oiled machine, and who cares about a well-oiled machine? You know, the thing is, like, if Holy Spirit is prompting you to do something, do it. Do it. And you're going to see wonders. Lately, uh, for past three weeks now, we've been studying the book of Galatians, and again, if you want to know what book we're going to be studying next Sunday, it's still going to be the book of Galatians. And if you want to come prepare, then continue to read the book of Galatians. And we'll still be in chapter 2 next, uh, uh, next week. But we're starting chapter 2 today. And I'm just going to kind of, uh, I don't know the English word for this, but I'm just going to go through the sermons a little bit. From the very first sermon, we've learned that we... There is only one gospel, right? The very first sermon we had in Galatians. There's only one gospel. There is no other good news out there. And so if you're the person who thinks like there are many ways to Jesus or there are many ways to, to be saved, uh, you are completely wrong. You're going to hear it from this stage and you should, as you read the scriptures, you're going to hear it from Paul. You are wrong if you think if there is any other name by Jesus that saves. There is no other name. There is no other gospel. And then we learned that the difference between, there's a difference between God's gospel and man's gospel. There is such a thing as man's gospel. Man's gospel loves to talk about what you need, what you want to have. It doesn't talk about salvation. It doesn't talk about need of repentance. And so God's gospel brings to life while man's gospel keeps the spiritually dead, dead. And last Sunday, Samson taught us that since we are saved, it is Christ who lives in us, and it is Christ who causes us to be like him. Right? And so that kind of like takes away from all of the like, well, I need to try. I need to try. I'm failing. I'm not good enough. And actually, we're still going to continue to talk about it because the way Paul wrote Galatians is just like, it kind of goes back and forth, back and forth. And uh, well, there's, well, we're going to repeat some stuff. And there's a, there's a good old Russian saying, repetition is a mother of all learning. 
Right, it sounds better in Russian, uh, but still, повторение uh, мачучения, <laughs> right? That's what that what we that's what we used to say all the time. And I would tell my mom or my dad, we're like, well, why am I repeating this? Because you're learning, son. You're learning. Well, why are we repeating so much about the gospel? Because you're learning. All right, you're learning. And soon enough, I guarantee you that as you immerse yourself into this teaching and as you study the gospel, the truth of the gospel more and more, you will have no issues talking to the stranger about Jesus Christ because you know. And the reason why we're not doing it is because we don't know. Right? And so as Paul, uh, from last sermon, uh, as, as Paul is kind of pleading with the Galatian, let Christ live through you. And I uh, thought about it. It's kind of interesting. Naturally, shouldn't it be me trying to be like Christ? Shouldn't it be I who works hard to grow spiritually? Shouldn't I come up with ways to become perfect like Jesus? Shouldn't I put a lot of effort into my spiritual growth? And so... As we do that, sometimes we tend to compare ourselves with other believers. Well, you know, Samson, you know, of course, you know, the way he preaches and the way he knows so much because he studied. And he studied and he went to college, you know, and, and he's just, uh, you know, he eats dry theology for breakfast. And, you know, that's why he's more Christ-like. <laughs> right? Or, oh, he is special, like Vince. <laughs> That is why he is godlier, <laughs> right? Oh, he's special. You know, that's the, you know, God, God has a special anointing on him. And for some reason, he just loves the word of God more, and, and he goes to church a lot more, and he, and, and, and he, he just immerses in church lives more, and that's why he's better than I. That's why he's more Christ-like. Or he has put a lot of effort of becoming, on becoming more Christ-like. And we walk away with, well, I want to be like that. So I'm going to go and try harder. I'm going to go try very, very hard to be like that. Because what I'm seeing in you, and believe me, I just came back from Shepherd's Conference. This is where all the big guns uh, teach theology, and I felt very, very little there. Okay, And uh, usually I don't take notes. This is, this is me. I was taking notes and notes and notes, and I'm coming back, and I'm like, oh, my God, I don't know enough, right? And I'm looking at John MacArthur and... and um, Alex Montoya was my favorite new preacher now, you know. And I'm like looking at them I'm like, oh, my gosh, like, wow, wow, I feel so little. And, you know, naturally speaking, I'd be like, okay, then, then I'm going to be like Samson. You know, I'm going to go buy some theology books, and I'm just going to swallow them up so I could be like that, you know. It's in, and uh, <laughs> Samson will love you. Uh, my kids actually, they're like, man, I love when Samson preaches. I'm like, what about me? <laughs> <laughs> that's, why, that's why I want to swallow some theology. And I was just <laughs> but no, no. And we walk away with like, oh, well, the reason why he's more Christ-like is because he puts more effort into it. And so I got to do it too. And in a way, we start doing the wrong thing. We begin to focus on so much on how to become like him and like her and like him. And we, we, want, we want this and that. And we put so much work into that that we're, sometimes we as Christians, we begin to burn out. We begin to get tired. We begin to think like, I, this is not happening. This is not going to happen. Something's not working here. And instead of reliance on the Holy Spirit, we begin to rely on our own efforts. And something similar is happening with Galatians. Where they heard the good news, they heard the gospel, they heard the saving grace, right? And then, and then they begin to, well, we need some works. We need to add something to this salvation. We need to make ourselves better so God would look down on us and be pleased with us, right? And we're going to read Galatians chapter 2, verses 1 through 5 now, where... Uh, Paul says, oh, no, oh, foolish Galatians. Who has cast an evil spell on you? For the meaning of Jesus Christ's death 
was made as clear to you as if you had seen a picture of his death on the cross. Let me ask you this question. Did you receive the Holy Spirit by obeying the law of Moses? Of course not. You received the Spirit because you believed the message you heard about Christ. How foolish can you be? After starting your new lives in the Spirit, why are you now trying to become perfect by your own human effort? Have you experienced so much for nothing? Surely it was not in vain, was it? I ask you again, does God give you the Holy Spirit and work miracles among you because you obey the law? Of course not. It's because you believe the message you heard about Christ. What a powerful passage. What a powerful passage. And judging by this language, Paul is not happy at all. In fact, as I'm reading, I'm trying, to, I'm trying to incorporate, you know, like how would he sound if he would be saying that, right? He's not happy at all. And he doesn't usually start his letters with, uh, to the foolish church of Romans, right? Or to the proud church of Corinth. Or to the clueless church of Jerusalem, right? He doesn't really start uh, his letters like that. He doesn't, he doesn't start his uh, passages like that. The reason why he's calling out Galatians or calling Galatians foolish is because he is astonished how quickly they turned away from the truth. And I think as we're teaching this and we're talking about this, I need you to go back to that day. I need you to go back to that day where you heard the gospel. I need you to go back to that day where you dropped on your knees and you've been asking God for forgiveness. Maybe you were sitting in a chair. Maybe, maybe you were on your knees. I need you to get back to that day. What did you hear that caused you to ask God into your life? What did you hear? What was the message? What were you going through? Because Galatians at one point, they heard the gospel loud and clear. He just preached the gospel to them. He preached the way of salvation to them, and they understood. And many of them dropped on their knees. Some of them just dropped on the floor. They were crying. They were weeping. They were surrendering because the Holy Spirit, he got a grip of them. They heard, they understood, and they repented. And so Paul saw that. Other believers saw that. All right, we saw that. We saw that you became, you became a believer. We saw it when you were born again. And I'm looking at you, and I can say the same thing about most of you. I know that you are children of God, and I know you had that day, and I know there was a moment when you were born again. But then maybe you're thinking, like, well, I'm not the same anymore. I'm not sure what I'm doing. I'm not sure why I'm not growing. I'm not sure what's happening in my life. I'm not sure why I'm so clueless. I'm not sure why I don't want to do things. I'm not sure why I'm not inspired. And we, let's just go along with what Paul is saying to Galatians. He says, who has cast an evil spell on you, Galatians? In some translation it says, who has bewitched you? Who has bewitched you? Paul is basically saying to Galatians, he says, you understood the meaning behind death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. You knew that it was impossible for you to atone for your sins. You knew that you were dead in sin and that you had no clue you were lost. You knew that God gave you faith and you believed his gospel. You knew that it was through faith alone you received the forgiveness of sins. So why are you leaving faith behind and trying to become perfect by your own human efforts? Why? You knew it was God who saved you. You knew it was God who's given you a new life. You knew it was God who's given you a new spirit. So why are you trying to become perfect in your own human efforts? That's the question. And I think that's a very good question because Galatians believed a lie. Galatians believed that Christ's sacrifice plus my good works equals salvation. All right? This is what they began to believe. Christ's sacrifice plus my good works is, equals salvation. And that is a lie. 
If you ever think about this, where Christ's work, where his sacrifice is good, but I now, now I need to top it off, now I need to do a little bit more to be saved, that is a lie. That is a lie. And here are some truths that we can extract from this passage. And first point is this. This is what Paul is making, and I'm making this point as well. Church, this is just a reminder to you. God was satisfied with his son's sacrifice on your behalf. Okay? Is that clear enough? You can write that one down. God was satisfied with his son's sacrifice on your behalf. So, when it comes to salvation, there's nothing else that needs to be done. Nothing. God was satisfied with his son's sacrifice on my behalf and on your behalf. Paul says, Galatians, you have forgotten the truth. And in, in, in verse 1, again, he says, O foolish Galatians, who has cast an evil spell on you? For the meaning of Jesus Christ's death was made as clear to you as if you had seen the picture of his death on the cross. And Paul is kind of stressing it out to Galatians. He says, the way to salvation was explained to you so well that it is as if you were there at the crucifixion yourself. That is, as if you were there and you witnessed it yourself. It was explained to you so clear. And God being satisfied uh, with his son's sacrifice on your behalf, that this is as clear as it gets. Okay? This is as clear as it gets. And so he's saying the same thing to Galatians. He says, it was so clear to you. As if you were there yourself. And someone said, faith in Christ's work on the cross and his, and his shed blood alone is the price that the Father demands for payment for our sin. I'll repeat that. Faith in Christ's work on the cross and his shed blood alone is the price that the Father demands for payment for our sin. And whoever believes in him is saved by grace. Christ is the propitiation for our sins, and God was satisfied with his son's sacrifice on our behalf. Do we understand that? Do we, so next time maybe you're thinking like, God, I'm not doing enough, and I'm not sure if I'm saved, so I'm going to go do some things. Do you understand that Christ's atonement was enough? It was enough. And in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, Paul says, God saved you by his grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. I can't shake this one up. I, I, every time I, I, you know, I think about of who I was and how God redeemed me and how, how God gave me life to, a, to this dead soul, I can't stop thinking about it. I can't stop talking about it. Because now Paul says that God saved you by his grace, meaning that you did not deserve this salvation and he still chose to save you, right? And, and when you believed, and, he, and you cannot take credit for this, it is a gift from God. So you cannot prepare yourself for salvation. In your former death state, you did not think you needed saving. You did not want salvation. You could not control your sinful nature. You were under the rule of the devil. You did not have the power to walk away from the oppression of sin. You couldn't. You did not earn your salvation. You got saved because it was all God's doing. And in his grace, he pointed you to the cross and he opened your eyes and he breathed life into you. That's what God did. Not because you deserved it. Not at all. It was because he chose to. He chose to. So you did not receive life because you earned it. You did not receive Holy Spirit because you did so well. And that attracted him somehow. <laughs> yeah, Alex might be pretty good. I'm just going to take him. You know, like that's a you know, good investment. Alex is a really bad investment. <laughs> so you know. And Alex makes bad investments too. So Alex is not, not qualified for investments. <laughs> And so, no, there's no way. He just looks at this guy and he says, oh, he's perfect. No, wow, he is <laughs> not perfect. <laughs> I'll take him. 
You did not receive Holy Spirit because you did so well and that attracted him. No, you received Holy Spirit because you believed the gospel. So in verse 2, Paul is asking a question. He says, let me ask you this one question. I love when Paul talks like that. I love when he doesn't just give you dry theology and he just like, He's just like talking to you there. So let me ask you this one question. Did you receive the Holy Spirit by obeying the law of Moses? Oh, in other words, some of you don't even know what the law of Moses is, but it's the laws that God gave to Moses in the first five books of the Bible, right? And so it's, and, and they obeyed him, and there was like 600 of them or something, you know, and, and so they obeyed every law. And so he says, did, did you receive the Holy Spirit by obeying the law of Moses? Oh, uh, of the Moses. <laughs> of Moses? In other words, did you receive Holy Spirit because you earned him, he's asking? Did you receive Holy Spirit because you obeyed all of God's law and God says you passed, so here's Holy Spirit? Or because you were a prospect in his eyes or something, an investment? And Paul answers that question, uh, of course not. Because you received the Spirit because you believed the message when you heard about Christ. And here's... What you might say, and what a believer might say, or just a churchgoer might say, well, of course. So, so, yes, it is because I believed. You see, God gave me the Spirit because I believed. So I did something. Huh? How about that? It's I did it, I chose to believe, and that's why God gave me Holy Spirit. So I earned that salvation in a way, and, and Holy Spirit, because I believed. No, no, no. Well, you might say, like, wait a second, but it, can't I take credit for this? Can't I take credit for believing? It says you believed and you received Holy Spirit. So can't I take credit for believing? Uh, we just looked at Ephesians 2.8. Let's look at it again. God saved you by his grace when you believed. Well, to answer your question, can you take credit? He answers that question, and you can't take credit for this. You cannot take credit for this because your faith is a gift from God. You believe because he gave you a gift. Not because you chose to believe, because that faith is a gift from God. Paul says, in any way, like, I mean, you guys can argue this one all you want. Read this. Paul says you cannot take credit at all. So when you chose to believe, there's no way like I believe, therefore I earn Holy Spirit, therefore I earn salvation. No, he says you can't take credit for this at all. It's a gift from God. In John chapter 6, verse 44, Jesus says, For no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them to me. And at the last day, I will raise them up. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them to me. How clear does that sound? Well, Jesus is saying, like, you can come to me if you want to. You come to me because God is drawing you to me. Like, that's a really scary state, and I really like, I want to worship God because I'm here and you're here. So you cannot believe unless the Father gives you faith. And Holy Spirit is there to finish the work of Christ. He works to exalt Christ in our hearts. He forms the image of Christ in us. He produces the fruits in our lives such as love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. He is the one that gives us growth. He is the one that empowers us to be Christ-like. It is Him. And maybe you've been trying very hard to be Christ-like, but you keep failing. And every time you go to sleep, you Go to sleep in shame because I've tried today, God, but I failed. God, I tried to be like you, but I just couldn't measure up. God, I tried this and I tried that, but I just don't understand. God, and sometimes I've been in there, and you probably said that too. God, I can't do this anymore. 
It's too hard to be a Christian. It's too hard to be your follower. And the answer to that is, you are absolutely right, and that is why you can't do it. Because it's not meant for you to do. You want to be better, but everything's the same. Failure after failure, and sometimes you're embarrassed to call yourself a believer. You might ask yourself a very serious and sensitive question. Why am I failing at being Christ-like? And the next point I just want to make, it is an application. We're done talking about Galatians. Let's talk about you. Let's talk about us. What would Paul say through this passage to this church today? It's simple. You want to be like Christ? It's not your job to make yourself Christ-like. It is not your job to make yourself Christ-like. Now, you're kind of scratching your head. You're like, whoa, I don't know if I want to believe that one. Because I have to put something into this relationship. Yes, absolutely. And you'll know what you'll have to do. But it is not your job to become Christ-like. Christ is God, and you are human. How could a human become like God? You'd have to be God. You don't know how to be like God. You don't know like to, how to be like Christ. Even if you're reading the scriptures, you don't understand God all the way. So there's no way you can accomplish that task. Human cannot become Christ-like because he does not know how to be like God. Only God can mold me into Christ's image. Only God can mold me into Christ's image. Only Holy Spirit can guide me into Christ-like living because he is God. And to make me Christ-like is God's work and not mine. And if I want to be Christ-like, it is God's work and then it's not mine. He is the one that sanctifies me. And in verse 4, Paul says, After starting your new lives in the Spirit, why are you now trying to become perfect by your own human efforts? Well, that's the question to you and me. Because you have been trying. And you have been setting up plans, and you have been setting up, like, uh, your life in a certain way. You know, I'm not going to send my kids to school because, uh, you know, it's too bad. I'm just going to, uh, it, it's, uh, you know, private school or it's home school. No, I'm not going to go here and there because, you know, I'm going to just surround myself with this and that and that, and I'm going to build this and this and that. And so, and still you find yourself not measuring up. Paul's saying, like, well, you believe that it's Jesus Christ or it's Holy Spirit who's giving you new life. Why can't you believe that he's the one that can continue to give you that new life? When did you stop believing that? When did you stop believing that he can transform you and start doing things on your own? Why are you trying to become perfect by your own human effort? In simple terms, Paul is saying, if, he's, if the saving faith is the work of Holy Spirit, don't you think your new life is his work too? If he worked on your heart and granted you saving faith, don't you think he can continue to perfect you? Don't you think? Right? So now we know the truth. But we're still thinking we need to do something. It's no way there's just like I'm just sitting here and I'm just going to be sitting in this chair and become sanctified. Right? And God is going to make me better Christian all the way. No, you still, you do, I'll tell you what you need to do. It's very simple. It's hard. But very simple at the same time, okay? And I'm going to jump ahead into Galatians a little bit. But it's in Galatians 5.16. So he says, answers the same question. So I'll let, I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. Huh. So what is it that I need to do? Let him. <laughs> so do I need to build stuff up? Do I, need to, do I need to do something? No, let him. Do you understand that word? Let him guide you so if he is your guide have you ever been on a guided trip or anything like have you ever followed somebody like uh, on the trail and they're guiding you and they're right i you know every time i go somewhere uh to a big city i like to you know i'd like to hit like uh, a museum or something and very often there are guides you know 
and, and so they'll tell you about it, right? And I'm just following. And, and, and the guide will say, like, well, for now, if you would step into this square and look at that direction, you will understand why so-and-so did this. And I'm like, wow, I understand. Wow. Why, why did I understand? Well, because the guide told me to step into the square and to look at that direction. And all of a sudden, I'm understanding what the guide is trying to say. It's simple as that. We were, uh, a long time ago, uh, when we were much younger, we, we went to the mountains and we were snow, snow uh, there was a lot of snow, and so people kept falling through, and the person in front, got the guide, he says, you see Vic Gedenko? They're like, yeah, just step in his footsteps, because he cannot go any deeper now. You know? <laughs> and so everyone is just like, stepping in Vic's footsteps, you know, because we know we're not going to go, we're not going to drown in snow anymore. If Vic, fall, if Vic falls through the snow, we're like, all right, we're just going to go in another direction, <laughs> which happened before, too. But the thing is, like, that's guiding. And the guide would say this, follow me, and you follow him. And the guide says, do not step here, and you do not step there. Guide says, look over there, and you look over there. God's, guide says, we're going to sit down right now, and you're going to sit down. This is what guide does. And what, what Paul is saying is, in order for you to become Christ-like, only Holy Spirit knows how that happens. Only Holy Spirit knows how to do that in your life. So instead of you trying to make things up on your own, he says just simply let him guide you. Let him guide you. And then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. Well, that might answer a lot of your questions. Why am I still doing what I'm doing? Well, maybe you're not listening. Maybe you're not listening to the guide. It is simple. Let Holy Spirit guide you. Let him teach you and tell you what to do. And I'm not going to go too deep into this specific passage because I'll be preaching on it later on and I don't want to steal from myself. <laughs> but this also means that if Holy Spirit is the one that guides us into becoming Christ-like, we get in the way. It also means that. That very often we get in his way. And we do not allow him to take control. We get in his way. Galatians had the idea that Christ's atonement plus good works, good works equals salvation. And God will be pleased with you. And Paul says, no, no, no. He poses a question in verse 5. And he says, I ask you again, does God give you the Holy Spirit and work, work miracles among you because you obeyed the law? Because you were such a good person? No, he says, of course not. It is because you believe the message you heard about Christ. Holy Spirit is in us and works miracles among us because we believed, and that is it. Holy Spirit. And this is the question that I want you to ask. This is the question that I am asking. Holy Spirit, how can I stay out of your way? So you would do what you want with me. And as we finish up this sermon, and as we are going to be praying soon, maybe that's the question you need to be asking. If you're like, I'm not growing. I don't know what's happening. Maybe you are in his way. Maybe you're not listening. So a good question is, Holy Spirit, how can I stay out of your way so you would do what you want with me? Let me remind you. In conclusion, God was satisfied with his son's sacrifice on your behalf. Walk away with that. Let's not forget that. Our faith in Christ's sacrifice was given to us by God. Let's not forget that either. Holy Spirit led us to saving faith, and he can lead you through this life into Christ's likeness. Let's not forget that either. It is not my efforts that make me Christ-like. It is the work of Holy Spirit. He will finish what he started. Amen? Amen. Let's bow our heads and pray. Holy Spirit, often it seems like I am or I get in your way. 
I don't want to do things that you want me to do. I read your scriptures and I see exactly what needs to be done. And then I begin to argue. And then I begin to disagree with you. And then I begin to look at other alternatives. Maybe I'm not understanding. And deep inside I still know I do understand. I know what God wants. And I get in the way. Lord, I've been asking, and a lot of of us have been asking, Lord, we want to be effective. We want to tell people about Jesus. And then at certain times you just, you just anoint us and you nudge us into, uh, you show us a person and, and we give us this desire to preach the good news to this person and we really want to, but then we, we, we start backing off. We're saying, God, you know, uh, I'm not ready. I don't think I know what I'm saying just yet. I don't think I'm ready enough. And so we get in the way. All you wanted to do is just give us practice maybe. Give us an experience. Maybe. Or maybe that person really could have been saved that day. Lord, we get in the way. We look at Galatians and we read, oh foolish Galatians, and we kind of chuckle. We're like, oh yeah, man, how could they? How could they just forget about the works of the Holy Spirit? How could they just simply go back to their own works? How could they? They're just so stupid. And at the same time, I'm realizing that we are doing the same thing, God. We look at Galatians, we laugh at them, but then we tend to make the same foolish mistakes. We say that we believe in saving grace. At the same time, we're trying to prove something to you, God. We're saying that the only, only Holy Spirit changes, but then we're trying to change ourselves. We're saying that the uh, Holy Spirit gives us the fruit and, and, and builds us up, but at the same time, we're trying, to, we're trying to make something happen. And when we hear your guidance, when we hear your voice, we tend to back off, Lord, and I pray that you would protect us from that. No more backing off. No more getting in the way. Lord, I pray that this whole church, whoever's listening right now, that they would take this by faith. When they read the scriptures and they begin to see that you're pushing them in a certain direction, let them take it by faith. I know, God, that you are a good father. And if we are making a mistake in all honesty and in all faithfulness, then you are going to take us by our shoulder and you're going to point us in the right direction because this is what you do. You will not let us fail there. And we believe that, God. So I pray that this church, whoever is listening, that there will be no more backing off and no more getting in the way, God. Let us fully surrender to you. Holy Spirit, continue to make us Christ-like. Please, please do not let us to get in your way. Amen. Church, would you stand with us as we finish the service singing uh, about grace? An orphan lost at the fall Running away when I'd hear you call But Father, you worked your will I had no righteousness on my own I had no right to draw near your throne But Father, you love me still And in love before child of God by grace and grace alone. You left your home to seek out the lost. You knew the great and terrible cost. But Jesus, your face was set. I worked my fingers down to the bone. No 
nothing I did could ever tell. Jesus, you paid my debt. By your blood, I have redemption and salvation. Lord, you died that I might reap what you have sown. all of my life I never knew the day from the night but spirit you made me see I swore I knew the way on my own head full of rocks a heart made of stone but spirit you moved in me at your touch my sleep And I hope that as you hear the message, you're like, yeah, that's something that I need to <laughs> work on or let Holy Spirit <laughs> work on. And I hope that walking away, you'd be like, I'm surrendering. God, teach me to surrender. God, teach me to surrender to you. And so uh, our worship service is over. Our fellowship is not over yet. We're going to have some snacks and some coffee. But I'm going to ask you one thing. If you are a man, I'm going to need you to, right after this service, I'm going to need you to come and meet me on that side right there. All right? Let the women get the snacks. <laughs> All the men on this side. Okay? Yes? Amen. All right. Thank you for coming. <laughs>